right, well, thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me to present this paper. Um, it's joint work with uh, Martin Van Ort at the, at the Bank of Canada. So uh, I won't read what's on this slide, but this, this is a, another paper about ICO financing. And like the previous paper, we also uh, focus uh, on the utility coin model. So the idea of uh, we're thinking about a, 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 the sale of a coin that's going to be used in some integrated way on a uh, e-commerce uh, platform. I think what is going to differentiate this work from the work you just saw, so broadly it addresses a very similar question, that is, is, is this a legitimate form of financing? Uh, but the main difference is that, uh, or one way to look at the, the difference is that they both have a moral hazard channel. That is, in both cases, there's, a, uh, there's this question of whether or not the interests of investors are aligned with the interests of the entrepreneur. Uh, but in Andreas's model, that moral hazard arose through the production aspect. So the uh, entrepreneur was, was the person that was going to sell items on the platform. That's possible in our model, but the best interpretation of our model, or the one we should go with for this talk just to differentiate it, is that the entrepreneur is not going to sell anything on the platform, but rather they're, pro they're the provider of the platform. And the entrepreneur has the ability to take some action that makes the platform work better, uh, but that's a hidden action that can't be contracted. And so the alignment, incentives, the alignment of incentives in our case is whether or not uh, the entrepreneur will take a costly action to improve the platform. So it's coming from the uh, operation of the platform side as opposed to the production side. Uh, but we can, we can use that uh, possible moral hazard issue uh, to think about how uh, uh, ICO financing uh, compares in terms of the alignment of interest versus other forms, conventional forms of financing, and so that's what we do. And so I was just going to start off with a little bit of motivation. Most people know these, but it's, it's quite remarkable. I mean, when most people started working on this stuff was sort of at the end of 2017 into 2018, there was this huge run-up in ICO financing. So I think there was, according to this data set, there were 780 ICOs worth $5.7 billion. And this peaked at one point. Uh, 9 billion in May of 18, but then it fell off quite dramatically. The last point in the data set, uh, December 18, is only 200 million. So there was this huge drop off. And so why was there this huge drop off? Well, one reason was a lot of regulatory uncertainty. Okay, so it was very unclear how the SEC was going to regulate these things. Things like the distinction between utility token and security token hadn't even been made yet. And then there was poor performance. So uh, rec uh, uh, data was starting to come in that a lot of these ICOs that had taken place over this boom period weren't doing so well. So all you're seeing on this chart is, is uh, the left axis gives you the number of ICOs, uh, uh, blue is success, red is failure, and then the black line measured on the, on the right axis is the success rate. So you saw that the data didn't look too good in terms of the performance. So you had regular, regulatory uncertainty, you had poor performance, and then you also had just outright fraud. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Success was defined here in terms of whether or not they met, met their soft cap uh, or whether or not they raised at least $500,000. So there was also fraud. Uh, so this is just a very high-profile case. This was this pin coin and, and iFan. So this was, uh, uh, and this is related because this is the type of thing that we're talking about, the idea of someone who's going to provide an e-commerce platform. This was a social media site uh, or was promised to be a social media site where you could use the native token in order to talk with celebrities and so on. So something like 32,000 investors were duped out of a total of $660 million, and then they just disappeared. Um, okay. So what are we going to do? We're going to look at a situation where an entrepreneur needs to raise funds for a project with an uncertain payoff. Uh, the entrepreneur can choose between, we'll look, actually look at all, th well, not all three, but we'll look at three forms of financing. We'll look at uh, venture capital, uh, uh, equity financing, uh, debt financing, or an ICO. Uh, we're going to do this in a world where there's no institutional differences. Okay, so we're not going to uh, uh, we're not going to look at things that might differ in terms of the institutional features of these dif different markets because we want to just look at the differences in the economic incentives. Um, so what happens is after raising uh, funds, the state of the world becomes known. That is how much sales are going to be possible on the platform. The entrepreneur then has an opportunity to decide whether or not to undertake some effort to improve the performance of the platform. And so this is, as I said, this is the classical incentive problem. Uh, that different mo modes of financing are, are going to impact. And so before I go any further, I'll summarize the results. Uh, uh, the first result is that all modes of financing uh, can be inefficient in this environment. That's, I'll, I'll explain that, but pretty well known. Well, it wasn't, I guess it wasn't already known for ICOs. 
uh, but that's also the case. Uh, each mode of financing can be better than the other two, and in fact, each mode of financing can be the only one that results in sufficiently high profitability for the product to be initiated. All right? So every single form of financing is best in some, uh, in some circumstances. Uh, our analysis is also going to reveal two potential uh, limitations of ICO financing. So what the model is going to do is it's going to tell us a couple of things that are unique about ICOs uh, that don't arise in, in the context of other financing. I'll save that for the end. Uh, and then another result is it's going to debunk the notion that funds raised through an ICO represent money for nothing. So one of the ways to think about an ICO, what do I mean by this, is that is it might be thought of as a seniorage grab, right? So you're just thinking about instead of uh, using money that's issued by uh, the government, where the government gets the seniorage, you issue the money yourself and you get that same seniorage. And what we're going to show, at least in the context uh, of our model, is that issuing the token comes at a cost to the platform operator, and that cost is exactly equal, the present value of that cost over time is exactly equal to the market values of the token. So the only benefit that you get from using ICO, to ICO token financing, or ICO financing, is a better alignment uh, uh, of incentives, or better alignment of the interests of the, between the uh, uh, investors and the entrepreneur. Okay, so here's how our model works, a little bit of the details. Uh, so we have a, a development stage and an operational stage. In the development stage at t equals zero, the decision is whether or not to start the project, okay? Uh, and which form of financing you're going to use. So you're going to use venture capital, debt, or ICO. Then uh, at that point, uh, what sales you'll get on the platform are unknown. Uh, then in t equals one, those sales are realized. So you see how successful the platform is going to be. And then you, as the entrepreneur, gets to decide whether or not to undertake some effort, uh, some costly effort, uh, which will result in either a better operating platform, a lower cost platform, CL, or a higher cost uh, platform, CH, which is uh, probabilistic. At t equals two, you then have a decision. You'll see whether or not your effort was successful. Okay? Uh, and then you'll have a decision whether or not to go ahead with operation of the platform or not, and then from that stage on, the platform just operates. Uh, the revenue that you get as the uh, entrepreneur is you're gonna collect some margin on sales on the platform. And specifically, we look at a very simple market. Uh, again, one could co specify more complicated markets. One could have downward sloping uh, demand, upward sloping supply, but really we're just trying to get at the incentives here, and we just needed a simplest way to think about having markets where revenue was going to be uncertain. And so the, what you should, the, way, the way we do this is that just think about the following market. You have a bunch of consumers. Each consumer has a reservation price of P, uh, the, the green line height, uh, for the product, but you don't know how many of those people they'll be. So that's the random variable, S is sales. The random variable is how many people there are out there that are willing to pay P for your product. Uh, PS is just the supply curve, so it's just elast elastically supplied, so there's some price that the market's willing to supply the, the, uh, uh, the product at, that's the blue line. And then what the entrepreneur is gonna do is try and capture a margin. And the margin, uh, uh, I've just shown there, if they were charging a margin M, that would mean that the, uh, uh, total price would be PS plus M, but then the, uh, the entrepreneur can, of course, capture that ent entire surplus, so the optimal margin for the entrepreneur is going to be equal to P minus PS. That's the revenue that the operator is going to get for having created the platform, multiplied the, by the amount of sales. So now we'll think about the optimization problem, and so the first thing we can think about is this decision to launch the platform. So we have to think about the period two problem, then we'll go back to the original decision of whether or not you should initiate the project in the first place, you have to backward induct. So the decision to launch the platform at period two, first of all, depends on what happened with effort. So remember back in period T equals one, the entrepreneur gets to make this decision on whether or not to uh, undertake effort, that's gonna result in a cost, either high or low, of, of operating the platform. As I mentioned, it's going to be a low cost. That happens with probability gamma, high, pros, high cost with probability one minus gamma. Uh, and then this decision is really pretty straightforward. You're going to launch the platform whenever it's uh, profitable. Okay? So that might not depend on the realization of effort. If, if uh, the margin is sufficiently high, you're going to uh, operate the platform no matter what your realization is of the cost parameter. Um, it might be the case that you only operate it 
uh, if the effort is successful. And it might be the case that you don't operate it ever, but that's not an interesting case. So we'll assume uh, that M star, it's hidden by this, uh, whatever this little play thing is at the bottom, but we're gonna assume that M star is at least as big as the low cost, okay? Okay. So then you have a decision uh, at period T equals one, and the, uh, there it's efficient to do effort whenever effort's beneficial, so very, very straightforward. So what you're looking at there is E bar is just the cost of undertaking effort, gamma is the probability your uh, effort reduces the cost, and then this is just S times the benefit you get. So if the margin was large and not binding, you would get CH minus L, otherwise it might fall in the middle, in which case you get M star minus CL. And then you just get that forever, so we discount that by dividing by the rate R, the risk-free rate R. So anyway, that's just the benefit uh, of, of uh, successful effort. So you're going to uh, undertake effort if the benefit of successful effort is less than the, the cost, sure. What is S? S is the realized sales. Yeah, so if you remember back here, S is this random, it's this random variable. So S is realized sales, that's right. So this is the benefit that you get. Oh, there's no laser. Uh, but, but the uh, M star minus CE is the benefit you get per, per unit, and then S is the number of units, okay? So S times the benefit per unit, and then you get it forever, so you divide through by R. Just a, it's a perpetuity, essentially. Okay. Okay, so then, so that's efficient to do effort under those circumstances. And then the game or the, or the problem to try and solve is, is to think about whether or not the different types of financing that you might use are going to alter this decision uh, to undertake effort. Okay, so, whether, so that's the benefit that you would get, say, if you were just deep pocketed doing it yourself. But if you actually finance, then depending on the mode of financing, somebody else might be accruing some of this benefit and that changes your incentive. So we're gonna look at whether or not you have this optimal incentive to do effort as a function of the financing choice, okay? Uh, and uh, then all the way back at t equals zero, we can just write a function which is just a value function, which is just showing you uh, what the value is of initiating the project at time zero as a function of the financing choice, that's j. Uh, what you're going to learn is that the financing choice J is going to determine a, determine a critical value S at which it's best to undertake effort. Uh, anyway, we break down that overall value uh, into the value of effort for which it's uh, uh, the value of the project without effort, and then a component which is the incremental value from undertaking effort. Okay, so you're going to undertake uh, optimal investment whenever the value of the project minus the cost minus the expected cost of effort is, is greater than zero. So that's, a, uh, that's the decision that the person makes back at, at, at t equals zero. So the benchmark problem, uh, and this is similar to as Andreas pointed, because the benchmark with deep pockets, there's no misalignment of, in, of, of, of interests. Uh, the investor and the entrepreneur are the same person. So the optimal problem for the benchmark is also the efficient uh, the efficient solution, so that's why all of the papers uh, uh, that are analyzing this type of question will look at this benchmark. Uh, so the, the deep-pocketed entrepreneur does effort whenever S is greater than S star. So S star, as I mentioned, is this value, uh, the value that's defined by this equation, so it's not in 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 embedding any type of financing. Uh, so that's the efficient benchmark. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to illustrate what the solution is in this case, and I'm going to show you how that solution changes when we consider the different forms of, of uh, financing. So in order to do some illustrations, we're going to simplify things a little bit. In what I talked about so far, F was just a, a generic distribution. Uh, that determine the realization of sales, but for the examples, we'll make F discrete. So S is going to take on either a, a high value or a low value with probability one half. So just two possible values for realized sales. Remember, every unit of sale comes at a price P. Uh, we're going to have other parameters, which are just things like the uh, initial investment, the personal cost of uh, effort to reduce costs on the platform, the uh, risk-free rate. Uh, and so on, so the margin 10 minus 8, so the possible margin there is 2, so on. And so what we get is we get a picture like this, 
And what this picture is showing you, again, is, is it's fixing all the other parameters except for SH and SL. So the high value of sales and the low value sales. Okay, so everything is above the 45 degree line uh, because uh, the high value sales has, has to be greater than the low value of sales. And so any point here is some combination of, of SH and SL. And then what the shaded regions tell you is what, uh, what the deep pocketed investor would do. So basically in this yellow region, both realizations of sales are so low that it's not worth undertaking the investment given the investment cost and the other parameters. Uh, in this blue region, we get uh, uh, investment, but we only get effort when the realization of sales is high. Okay, And in the purple region, uh, we get investment and we always get effort. So given the parameterization, parameterization of this particular example, under the deep pocketed solution, efficiency means that investment occurs and effort always occurs. Okay. Now we're gonna to move to debt financing. Now I'm not gonna work through all the details, I only have about 10 minutes, but I'll give you the intuition. So when we move to debt financing, what's gonna happen is we're gonna get a cutoff for uh, sales that's greater uh, than S star, okay? The, the level of sales that's gonna be required to induce efficiency uh, or optimal effort is gonna be greater than S star. Now, not always, okay? When effort, doing effort does not impact the repayment of the debt, the cutoff is still gonna be the, the usual, the same cutoff as in the benchmark case, but when successful effort is necessary to repay the debt, the cutoff is gonna be higher. Now, this is what in finance we call the classic debt overhang problem. Just intuitively, what's happening here is that when I undertake effort, okay, I'm gonna increase, uh, I'm gonna increase the profitability of the platform, okay? If, I am, uh, if some share of that profit is gonna go to repay the debt, I'm not fully incentivized to undertake that effort. You could think about an extreme case where the profitability of the platform is so low that even if I'm completely successful, I still won't fully pay off the debt. Then if I undertook effort, all I would do is be uh, doing effort to pay you more money, you the investor, and so I wouldn't do that. Okay, so that's the incentive problem. If we move to that case, then what we see is in the picture, uh, compared to deep pockets, which is efficient, we now move to a situation that's slightly worse, okay? It's slightly worse in the sense that uh, we get investment, uh, but we only get effort when the high uh, sales is realized, okay? That's inefficient because efficiency requires that the person always undertake effort, but this, this region, the purple region has shrunk, okay? Yeah. Yeah, so that's, okay, let me, let me get through, and then let's, yeah, because that's not a, yeah, that's a perfectly good question, but let me try and get through. Okay, so what happens with venture capital With venture capital, it's a lot easier to, to understand than basically the debt model, because with venture capital, basically, somebody else is going to get a share of everything you earn, okay? So the, your incentives to undertake uh, effort to increase the profit are, are reduced, and again, you get, a, you get a situation where you're going to need higher sales in order to undertake effort in some cases. And so, in fact, as Andreas was pointing out, that debt is usually better than, than equity. Uh, what we get here is a similar finding, which is that venture capital is actually the worst in this, uh, in this particular example, uh, because not only do we not get, or we get investment, but we, don't get, uh, we do not get in, uh, effort ever. Okay, so there's this green region where you get investment but no effort. So again, deep pockets is that you should have investment and effort always. Venture capital had investment in the high, uh, investment but effort in the high state. Here you never get effort. So venture capital is worse than the other two in this particular uh, example. Okay, now I need to move on to ICOs. And the first thing I wanna make is this is one of the differences that arises in ICO financing, which, uh, which is, I think, quite interesting. And this is uh, the idea that with ICO financing, it's possible that one could try to undertake currency manipulation, okay? So the idea here is, is that we're thinking about a situation where the entrepreneur is gonna sell tokens to investors, and then we think about models where those tokens are used on the platform and we generate what the value proposition is given that, given that idea, but why should the uh, uh, investors uh, uh, 
set, put all the, all the coins on the platform. Maybe they should try to uh, manipulate the price of the tokens. And so I'm just going to go through a quick example. This isn't the optimal strategy, but it's just an example to illustrate my point. Okay, suppose that the in token investor puts all the tokens on the platform at period M. Revenue on the platform is S times P, so the exchange rate, I'm assuming M tokens, is going to be uh, SP over M. Now consider a different strategy uh, where instead of doing that, they hold back 50% of the tokens. So they put 50% of the tokens on the, on the platform. That gives an exchange rate of S2 equals SP over 0.5M, because that's the only way to buy the product. Uh, and then in period three, they release the rest of the tokens. And the, rest, and the tokens from the first period will also be present, so the exchange rate will be SP over M. Then what you're going to find is that's going to increase the revenue to the, token, to the original token holder. All right, so they would like to manipulate the currency. So what we do in the paper, I don't have time uh, to go through it, but what we do is we can solve this problem. It's an infinite horizon problem, but if you actually look at the optimization, I can't explain all this math. I don't have the time. I mean, I can't explain it, but I don't have the time. Uh, uh, but basically, you're doing an optimization of how many coins of your stock you want to uh, put on the platform each period. And if you look at each of those optimization problems, they overlap, and you can solve them by just looking at this relatively simple expression at the bottom. Uh, and anyway, what you find is that uh, the solution uh, is, 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 is uh, uh, pretty straightforward, and the exchange rate is going to be a con and you want to release all the tokens under uh, certain conditions. And so what we basically show is that uh, under certain conditions, uh, it is optimal for the original holder of the investors, uh, holders of the tokens to release all of them on the platform in the first period. Those, to those uh, conditions have to do with diversify uh, the tokens being relatively uh, 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 ownership to be diverse. Okay, so in the example, I told you about someone who owned all the tokens and they could manipulate the price so long as uh, either a large number of people, different people hold the tokens, or there's uh, one large person and a bunch of small people, but that large person doesn't hold too much. You don't have to worry about interpreting these equations. I realize there's not time. But again, the idea is as long as the ownership of the to tokens is sufficiently dispersed, then to token holders can't manipulate the price or don't have an incentive to attempt to manipulate the price. It's an important result in the paper. Okay. Uh, where does the possible inefficiency come from in the token model? The possible in inefficiency in the token model comes from the fact that the uh, entrepreneur may not decide to go ahead with the operation of the program, uh, with, the, with the platform. They may not keep their commitment. If they don't keep their commitment, then ownership of the platform falls back to the token holders in the shares to which they uh, own them. So it essentially becomes an, an equity model. And the second point that I want to make quite, that I think is quite interesting here, because this is the money for nothing point, uh, that no, the tokens don't represent money for nothing, is that if we look at the change in cash flow, so again, I won't have time to explain these exactly, but we have the deep pocketed case, and what you're seeing is what the entrepreneur is getting is uh, each period they're getting their margin, so S times P minus PS and so on. In the ICO case, the pay, uh, payment stream changes. They're going to get some payment in period two from the tokens that they held back, all right, and that's solved optimally in the model, by the way. The, the uh, entrepreneur does not release all of the tokens to the market. It releases a share of the tokens, uh, just enough to cover the uh, investment need. Uh, but then it gets revenue from its tokens in the following period. And the uh, people who, and, but that's discounted because the tokens don't earn interest. And so the margin uh, is impacted by the fact that the, uh, uh, when people use tokens to purchase on the platform, they have to allow for the time value of money. So there's a discounting there. Anyway, if you look at the difference between the streams and take the present value of that difference, you get the result that the cost to the entrepreneur of introducing tokens or of launching tokens uh, is exactly equal to the market value of the tokens. So no money is created out of thin air. The only sense in which tokens are become beneficial is if they improve the alignment uh, of the interest between the investors and the entrepreneur. OK. Uh, again, the inefficiency here arises uh, because it might be the case uh, that uh, you, uh, uh, without, without, that sales won't be sufficiently high that you might choose to default. Uh, in, in if, if, if the margin is sufficiently high, it's just like the efficient case. If margin is sufficiently low, it's just like the equity case. And in between, you have this misalignment where uh, you need a, a higher S in order to undertake effort. So what we get in terms of a picture uh, is this case 
which is that we've restored efficiency. So again, this is a constructed example. As I told you, all, all sort of orderings of, of, of best financing method are possible. But in this particular case, what we get is that the initial coin offering is uh, the only efficient one in this particular example, or the only one that matches uh, the deep pocketed case. OK. So just summarizing the results, summarizing the results uh, all mo modes of financing can be inefficient. Uh, each mode can be better than the other two. Uh, each mode of financing can be the only one that allows the project to be initiated. Okay, so uh, again, when, when the initial investment is undertaken, the investors are cognitive of, of how the actions, uh, how the, what the incentives are of the entrepreneur, and some projects aren't possible uh, if the uh, incentives are not well enough aligned. Uh, and then the point that I just raced through, uh, that an ICO generates no value beyond that created by a better alignment of incentives. Okay, uh, just a quick uh, comment on the uh, related literature. Uh, what we're really doing is we're taking well-known results from, from the uh, debt financing and venture capital financing literature. We're using a similar framework and extending these to uh, initial coin offerings. Uh, the value of the token, so this isn't a crowdfunding model where a token gives you a right to a certain number of units. The token is money. That value has to have money in the model, so that's related to this literature that uh, talks about the valuation of, of, uh, of private digital currencies. And then I've just got a partial list here, but there's a huge number of papers uh, now that all look at the benefit of ICO as a funding model. It's really quite remarkable. I mean, the, there's just many, many different reasons that people have been using, all positive. All these papers are coming up with exciting and creative reasons, uh, all complementary, I believe, as to why this model of financing is a legitimate one. So question at start, are ICOs a passing fad or a worthwhile form of financing? The latter. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, one of the interesting things that, coming, that comes from studying the ICO model uh, in, in our model is that, uh, first of all, uh, this is something I didn't mention in some sense because I think because I was, I was, I was going quickly. But one of the if, if potential inefficiencies that comes from ICO financing is that you can be limited in, term much how, in terms of how much funds you can raise. So the maximum amount of funds you can raise in the ICO model is one period sales. Okay, so in, if the cost of the project is large relative to uh, uh, sales on the platform, then ICO fi financing simply doesn't work. So that's, that's one point. And then the other point is this point I made about potential uh, manipulation of the currency markets. So that's something that one has to be sure. Uh, if one does an ICO and a large number of those coins en ends in the hands of uh, a single individual or possibly even in the hands of, stay in the hands of the entrepreneur, then one has to worry about currency manipulation. All right. Merci à tout. Um, I think maybe it could be interesting in your in your model to to study what the optimal contract is. Uh, so you have a, a, mo a timing in which you have you invest, you observe S, you decide the effort, and then you observe the the, the profit, the realization of the cost. Um, so you, an optimal contract would be one in which you would have transfers that would be contingent on all the observable variables which are in your model. The cost, and and S. Yes, but but not I, but not E. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. Because E is pri is you know is privately yeah. uh, exerted, and so I suspect that the the reason why uh, debt is not working very well in your model is because it's not contingent on S. Uh, maybe I did not understand very well how you did the tokens, but maybe yeah. the tokens are a way to condition on S. And I think it would be interesting to know what is the optimal way. Yeah, so, th so to that's... To take everything into account. Yeah. And then to study if that optimal contract can be implemented, maybe with tokens or maybe with something else. Yeah, th that's an excellent question. We have, we have thought about that. So what we, I mean, we, what we set out to do here was to, I guess, to conduct a horse race, right, between conventional modes of financing. Uh, that was the original... Uh, 
uh, impetus for doing this project. That's what we basically did. But you're exactly right. One could step back and think of this as a more general mechanism design problem because what really comes out here is, is just as you, you, you almost said it explicitly, but you certainly said it implicitly, what makes, to what makes ICOs so, work so well is they're a form of revenue sharing. Uh, so uh, when you undertake effort, uh, uh, you reduce costs, which impacts the profit, but it doesn't impact the revenue. And so ICOs are particularly good in this model. Um, but you're right. Thinking about this from a more general mechanism design problem is really about solving for the optimal revenue sharing contract. Absolutely. Uh, sure. I think you have talked about the commitment power in terms of the currency manip manipulation. So I wonder uh, uh, what is the value of the commitment power? So if you are able to commit that you, uh, how you manipulate the cur currency contingent on something like the S, then I wonder what is the commitment power, uh, sorry, what is the value of this commitment power and how does it affect the financing? Yeah, that's, that's also a really good question. Uh, maybe my presentation was clearer than I thought. Uh, um, it, the way we do it is we, we come up with, uh, we come up with a, uh, conditions under which manipulation, under which there's no incentive for the investors to, to attempt to manipulate the, the uh, currency. And then we assume those conditions hold. So everything that we do in the model is under the assumption well, I don't like assumption, but it, well, it is, it's under the assumption that no, that no one attempts to manipulate. The investors supply all the, the, the coins uh, to the market uh, when the market's open. But, but now, again, I, that's not an assumption per se, because what we do is we outline the conditions in terms of the initial ownership of the token such that that will happen. Uh, so, but we haven't looked at what the impact would be if those assumptions did not hold, if, if people were attempting. It's a, it's a very good question. Thank you. Something we should do. You just said, uh, I, me again, after debt capital, um, you just said uh, ICO were like for your revenue sharing agreement, I think they do differentiate. Uh, we have utility token, which is a prepaid services that the user pay uh, upfront for services to be consumed three, six months, nine months after being mainnet. And the revenue sharing agreement is completely different. I think maybe your model could be very interesting to um, pushed further into a revenue sharing agreement with a trigger acceleration within time T. So you don't, you don't downgrade the royalty payment to set an acceptable level for the entrepreneur, and then you have a premium coming at time T after, which is something very, I'm done very mainly in the US. I've seen it like very often. Yeah, so I guess all I'll say to that is let, let's talk. I mean, I'd like to, we, we, we've looked at, at non-contingent Debt, debt and, and, and uh, financing contracts, and there's there obviously would be some interest in doing just what you're saying. So let's let's talk more about that afterwards. Thank thank you for those suggestions.